Andy, you've nearly finished your, your PhD. Yeah. Uh, you've been working on um, syncing uh, audio uh, and video, if you like. That's it. Uh, you've come up with something uh, really very dramatic, and uh, it's going to change probably uh, commercial advertising uh, that you see on telly um, forever, really. Uh, just tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Okay, so sync points are the, uh, the crux of my research, and um, sync point in audiovisual media, and audiovisual media being a, a term for anything from watching uh, YouTube on your phone to seeing a film in the cinema, is when auditory and visual elements align as in synchrony. Um, so a, a, a clap would be a really simple demonstration of this. Both sight and sound arrive at the same time and are congruent. That's to say, you know, the sound of a dog barking didn't come out when I clapped my hands together. Um, now, sounds aren't always congruent in audiovisual media, which is one of the more interesting compositional um, possibilities that separate it from our literal day-to-day -day audiovisual experiences, the kind of experiences that help us get around without being run over. Um, a great example of this um, incongruent sound is the hyper-reality of some Hollywood-style sound effects. So, if you ever noticed how noisy every single door is in, in a movie, or that completely OTT thump sound in a punch-up. These are utterly unrealistic sonic and visual pairings, but happily accepted because we're conditioned to it. Uh, it's become normal, um, and it's aptly called hyper-realism because it takes that pinch of normality and adds a, adds a dollop of excitement to it. Music, on an emotional level, functions in exactly the same manner, um, and it's how music works to synchronise with the visuals that keeps me curious. Um, now, if something sad happened to me, a string quartet doesn't follow me around playing sustained minor melodies. But in a film, this would be perfectly normal. However, uh, we do su all supplement our lives with music to aid our emotional states. Think about the gym. There aren't many people who suffer the monotony of, uh, of the treadmill without a set of headphones on, churning out steady pulse, keep them driving along. Um, interestingly, though, uh, numerous studies have shown that listening to music like this makes us all suffer less and perform better. So I began to wonder how all the music that accompanies audiovisual media affects us, because surely it isn't there without a predetermined purpose. So the idea of musical integration to our perceptual whole when exper experiencing audiovisual media relies on an exploitation of our audiovisual perceptual systems, willingness to integrate coincidental auditory and visual sensory input. In contrast to other senses like touch and taste, Audition and vision are primarily concerned with sources around and at a distance from the body, which means they're awesome at resolving spatial and temporal information. As they both have similar information gathered from the same source, their integration is beneficial to us. The two sensory system, uh, signals interact to resolve any absent information in their counterpart. So they're a good team and they like to work together. I believe you've got uh, a demonstration uh of this um, that you you put together as part of your PhD. That's you just it. want to talk us through it and uh, show us how it works. Sure. So the the thing that's really interesting about this was when I'm talking about these sync points, um, we're talking about very very small displacements, very very small. Um, for example, um, the tests we ran were based on people's implicit memory recall. So we wanted to see how much stuff in the visuals they could remember, based on changing the music very slightly. And our changing of the music very slightly was literally, at, at the largest, a six frame displacement. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That's it. Now, if you watch this and think about the arrangement between the two. Okay. I, I couldn't tell a thing. Here we go. I'm going to shift it back. Six frames. So back to its original alignment. Perceptually, there's no difference no, because not at all. the music shouldn't be there anyway. It's non-diegetic. Um, but the, the thing that, that is, is, is really quite fascinating about this is when we've tested people's memory on, on, on this alignment, um, we actually get this response curve in the memory. So that is the six frame displacement where we see this peak here. Um, and this oscillation is the return in memory. So there's your baseline memory recall. That is any old music, any, any arrangement. And then what we've done is displaced it by these are milliseconds, 20, 40, 60, 80, so on and so forth. And so we see a slight peak in return of memory, then a dip, then a peak, then a dip, then a bigger peak again at this uh, nearly six frame point. 
Um, so what that's demonstrating to us is that the music is in training a neural oscillation. It's you're synchronizing to it in the same way that you you bounce, you bop along, you dance to some music. Your your brain is actually creating that cycle, and what that does is it creates a lot of peaks and troughs in your attention. So if you can deliver visual information at the right time in that information span that you've created from the from the music from the entrainment there, you're going to get a better memory recall. And if you've got a better memory recall, you've got a better advert. The University of Huddersfield, inspiring tomorrow's professionals.